Hello there, and welcome to the African Kingdoms. This is going to be my pre-release first look video at the new expansion pack, which is coming to Steam on the 5th of November. I'm really excited to do this, and I did a little poll. It turns out that you guys want to see the tech tree for the new civilizations, and a coverage, an overview of all the new features that the game adds. So that is what you are going to get in this video right here, starting with the tech tree, and then moving on to the other stuff such as new maps and new terrains and things like that. So before we go any further forward, I do want to point out that this is pre-release footage, which means that between now and the time that the game is released, there may be some changes to the things that you see in this video. It may not necessarily be final, so do keep that in mind. But without any further ado, let's hop into the tech tree and see what is new. Now. I want to point out that I will be doing a really in-depth look at each of the new civilizations once the game is released. I'll have a video for each new civ, really drilling down into all of their bonuses and really looking at how it could affect the game, looking at everything in much de more detail than in this video, because I can't keep this video going for a few hours, because that's how long it may take to look at everything in depth. So we will do a quick skim over the new civs, but before we do that, we have to look at some new things that have been added into the game that will be available for every civilization. So the first thing that is going to be available to every civ will be the arson technology. New tech available from the barracks in the castle age. As you can see, it costs 150 food and 50 gold, so it's not that expensive at all, and it allows melee units to do more damage versus buildings. This is really cool. It does mean that that mana arms, maybe that long swordsman push could come into play. This will affect every melee unit in the game, not just barracks units, but also unique units that may be infantry as well. Now, I really like this, and uh, I think it could be put to good use. It's going to be a very, very situational technology, but let's say, for instance, your opponent's got a house wall up, and uh, you've got a few infantry units around. You could tear through that wall with those units, instead of having to build a siege workshop, for instance. And it could also be great to try and just use it to take down your opponent's military production buildings, or something along those lines. It does give your military units plus two damage versus buildings, and that really does add up to quite a lot when you consider that the champion line already has an attack bonus versus buildings as well. So that's arson. Next unique technology, well, not unique technology, sorry, the next technology is from the university, and that's arrow slits. Now this is a technology which gives your towers more attack damage. It costs 150 food and 150 wood, and it's an attempt to make guard towers and keeps a little bit more useful and a little bit more viable. Because let's be honest, how often do we really see players making guard towers and keeps? Well, we don't. If you have the option of a bombard tower or a keep, you're going to take Bombard Tower pretty much every time. And if you have the option of a castle or a few keeps or guard towers, you're still going to choose the castle because it allows you to, to build trebuchets, your unique unit, it does more damage, it fires more arrows. So Arrow Slits is an attempt to make guard towers and keeps more viable and give civilizations an option. Civilizations that don't get Bombard Towers may be able to use keeps now. It does affect the towers differently. It gives guard towers more extra attack than watch towers. It gives keeps more additional attack than guard towers. So those are the two universal new technologies. But we've also got some new units as well. And the first one of those, which we'll look at, is the Siege Tower, which is available from the Siege Workshop. So for those of you who are familiar with the Forgotten Empires before it really came to Steam, the Siege Tower was in the game way back, but it didn't really do much. It was kind of a really weird unit that fired arrows and didn't actually have a whole lot of use. But now the siege tower actually works like you would expect. You put units in it and they hop right over the wall. We're going to show you this in action right now as uh, in the scenario editor with the demonstration. All right, so here's the bad boy right here, the Siege Tower with 220 HP, 100 Pierce Armor, and a capacity of 10 units. 
Now the question is, what units can go inside? If we try and grab the Hussar, you'll see that we can right click around the tower, but there's no garrison option. By pressing the garrison inside, we can see that it won't let us put the Hussar in. So you're not able to put cavalry inside of these guys. But you can put infantry and archers inside. And you do that by simply selecting them and right clicking on the siege tower. Nicely, the siege tower won't move, like a transport ship will try and move to meet your units, the siege tower will stay stationary, and then you can move it around like a standard unit, like a ram almost, with units inside. Now, there is a problem here, you can't ungarrison if there is no room behind the wall. So there's no good trying to drop off units behind a double layer wall. If you try and drop them off at a gate, it's simply not going to give you the option to do that, that would make no sense. But if there is a single piece of wall, you should be able to garrison or unload over the other side. Now sadly, in this version of the build that I have right now, ungarrisoning is not working correctly. However, I can assure you, as you have seen in the trailer to the African Kingdoms, that it does indeed work. You simply right click the wall and the units will hop over. Clearly, there's a small bug right now that's going to be fixed before the release comes out. There's also new units for the water, and that is the Fire Galley and the Demolition Raft. Two new feudal ships that allows you to actually break the meta a little bit and deviate from making galleys in the feudal age. How awesome is that? It's basically a Feudal Age fire ship and a Feudal Age demolition ship. They're a little weaker and they do less damage and they are... It's going to be really interesting to see how these guys really shake it up a bit. And the idea is to recreate that water triangle in the Feudal Age. A lot of the reason why we only see galley wars in the Feudal Castle and Imperial Age is because fire ships only become available in the Castle Age. Whereas now you can make them in the, you know, in the, da in the Feudal Age and you can upgrade them to fire ships later and they're actually really very effective against one another. So that's it for the new technologies and the new units. Really, really cool and unique stuff. But let's move on to the ones that you really want to see, and that is, of course, the new civilizations. So first up, we have the Berbers. Now, the Berbers are a cavalry and naval civilization. Their villagers move 10% faster. Their stable units cost 20% less from the Castle Age onwards. Their ships move 10% faster. They get two unique units, the Camel Archer and the Geniator. They get two unique techs, Kasbah, which makes team castles work faster, and Magrabi Camels, which makes their camels regenerate, similar to the Berserks uh, from the Vikings. And their team bonus is that the Geniator is available in the archery range. Now, I will, like I say, have a video for each new civilization going in real depth about all of these things and how I think it's going to affect the game. But we'll have a very quick look over their tech tree now before moving on to the next civ. So the Berbers here then, they get that Genia Torp from the archery range. And this functions very similarly to the Condiatero, where if you are an ally of the Italians, you get the Condiatero in your barracks. Now with the Berbers, if you are the ally of the Berbers, you get the Genia Torp in your archery range. And the Genia Torp is pretty cool. It's essentially a mounted skirmisher. It costs twice as much food as the elite skirmisher but it does cost the same amount of wood, so it's not hugely more expensive. It has more attack, it has more hit points, and I think it's actually going to be a very versatile unit, a very useful unit in the Imperial Age when it's upgraded to the Elite Geniator, and when you might be in a bit of a trash war in a team game. It could be useful for raiding enemy trade lines. Of course, it's going to be a lot better than a skirmisher at taking down other archer units. Since it's mounted, it can close the gap a little faster towards the enemy, and I honestly think I think this is a really cool, cool unit, and we will see this in action in the scenario editor in just a moment. So let's see the Elite Geniator in action. First of all, on the left side, we have the standard Geniator. It has 60 HP, it has 4 attack damage, 3 pierce armor, and 3 range. If we compare that to Elite Skirmisher, you see that it has a considerably more amount of HP. It does have the same pierce armor, but it also has more attack. It does, however, suffer from lower range. So three range, uh, certainly a lot less than the five of the Elite Skirmisher. These are, of course, upgradable from the Blacksmith. The Elite Genius Tour is slightly better, though. This one, obviously, more HP. It has an additional 10 HP versus the standard one. 
It has the same attack damage, but bear in mind it still keeps a huge attack bonus versus archer units. It has one more pierce armor, so four instead of three, and it has one more range as well, which puts it at one range below an elite skirm, but with uh, even pierce armor here, and um, also with uh, more HP as well, as well as more attack. So the Elite Units are very, very formidable in my opinion. It looks like those stats are really bad, but when you consider how good they're going to be against archers, that's what it's all about. And if you think 4 plus 4 attack, that's 8 attack damage, run a bunch of those into your enemy's trade line, and they could do quite a lot of damage indeed. So let's put the Elite Genitor and the Elite Skirmisher in a side-by-side -side comparison here. I'll delete this outpost and you'll see two enemy Arbalest spawn. These guys are going to start attacking and you'll be able to see just how effective they are. Clearly, they're going to be very strong against ranged units. And there you go, that Arbalest on the right side going down immediately. The one on the left taking a little longer, a couple more shots. And if you have a look at the remaining HP... The Elite Skirmisher, 17 HP remain, and the Elite Genitor, 58 HP. And bear in mind that that Genitor has double the base HP of a Skirmisher anyway, and barely a scratch has been given. So these guys are much more formidable against Archer units, and since they're mounted, that is another great advantage to them as well. Offset, of course, by their increased cost. Their other unique unit, the Camel Archer, is their main unique unit from the castle. This is a really cool one, because it's a Cavalry Archer that counters Cavalry Archers. It's one of the first units in the game that truly counters Cavalry Archers, excluding Skirmisher. Skirmishers, of course, and that's a really nice counter to things like the Mangadai, the War Wagon, um, the Hun Cavalry Archer, which are all really, really, really strong units. So the Camel Archer there, and that is um, not too expensive, a little more than a Cavalry Archer would cost from the archery range, um, but the same amount of gold and, uh, you know, reasonable statistics. They are going to be a little confusing to some players because they are camels, and typically camels counter cavalry, whereas the Camel Archer actually would lose to heavy cavalry, but they will of course counter those cavalry archers. Now the Berbus tech tree is kind of interesting in general. I think they're a really strong castle age civilization because of those cheaper knights of course from the stable units costing less. Um, they actually have an interesting tech tree and like I say I will cover this in much more depth in my civilization overviews. But I feel like they fall off in the late imperial age. In the imperial age they may struggle a little bit but in the castle age they are super strong. I think they're a very aggressive civ and if we take a quick look over here um, at the blacksmith and the siege workshop you'll see that they get a pretty padded out blacksmith. Since they're a cavalry sieve, they do lack that final archer armor upgrade. But, um, you know, generally speaking, they're pretty pretty good over there. Um, and they also lack some heavy siege, but they do get that bombard cannon, so that is something. They also, over on the economy side of things, get a great eco. They do miss two-man saw, which is really weird in my opinion. And again, like I say, I'll talk about that more in the sieve video. But uh, since they're a naval sieve, to not have two-man saw is kind of weird, right? However, the rest of their economy is super strong. Crop rotation at the mill, um, all of the market upgrades and all of the mining upgrades. So that's the Berbers in a nutshell. Next up, we have the Ethiopians, which are an archer civilization. Their unique bonuses are that archers fire 15% faster. They receive 100 gold and 100 food when they reach the next age. They get pikemen and halberdier for free. And that is kind of cool. Their unique unit is the Shotel Warrior. You'll be hearing me call them Hotel Warriors. <laughs> and uh, their unique technologies are Royal Airs, which means that Shotel Warriors are created nearly instantly basically instantly, and torsion engines, uh, which makes their, makes their siege workshop units have a larger blast radius. Very, very strong for those siege onagers. Their team bonus is that towers and outposts have plus three line of sight. So let's take a look quickly at the Shotel Warrior, their unique unit from the castle. The Shotel Warrior is kind of cool because it is uh, um, a very, very, very fast unit. Like it said over on the left side there on the tech description, sorry. Like it said over on the sieve description, they create nearly instantly. Their train time is very, very quick and it makes them a fantastic raiding unit. They raid so, so very well. To offset that, they have very low HP and they have basically no armor. So they're very weak to arrow fire. They're very weak to, you know, engagements head to head, toe to toe with strong cavalry and uh, infantry. 
However, if they get into your economy, they can do a lot of damage and they can kill villagers very quickly. They can kill trade carts very quickly. So the Shotel Warrior is a fantastic raiding unit and since it creates so quickly as well, it can be used as like a last minute defense to try and just defend yourself from uh, enemies that might be at the gate. So the Ethiopian Archery Range is going to be pretty strong since they're an archer civilization and I think that's more talking about foot archers than anything else and really that's just their arbalest. The archers firing plus 15% faster going to affect the arbalest in a big way and it makes sense that they get that as well as thumb ring which of course makes them fire faster still and with better accuracy, 100% poofed, not really. Um, so they also get the elite skirmisher, um, they do not however get very good heavy cavalry archers here with no Parthian tactics uh, and no hand cannons as well. But you've got a question, do they really need hand cannons? They get arbalest. Um, Barracks wise, they're lacking that champion, but they do get Haubs, and uh, looking over at the stable, you see they get Hussar as well, though no bloodlines, which means that they actually have a good variety of trash, and that is pretty good for them in the late game if gold becomes a problem. Their stable, yeah, kind of lacking. Of course, they get heavy camels since they are an African sieve. But uh, no Paladin, of course, and since, like I said, they have no bloodlines, all of their cavalry is going to be, you know, just down a notch due to the lack of that extra 20 HP. The Dock, they're looking fine for the Feudal Castle Age. They may start to fall off in the Imperial Age, but since they get Galleon and Shipwright, I think they're going to be fine right there. Uh, Galleon's, of course, going to be absolutely fine. Um, heavy demolition ship and fast fire ship missing, not going to be the end of the world for them. Moving on to the monastery, and they don't get block printing or redemption, but they do get a good variety of other technologies. Though I, I guess redemption is a really interesting and important tech in the castle age if you're trying to, to push an enemy very aggressively by converting their buildings. And block printing makes their monks fall off a little in Imperial due to not having that extra conversion range. Now, the Siege Workshop is pretty banging. Look at that. So much stuff available. In fact, everything is available from the Siege Workshop there. They get the Siege Onager, Siege Ram, Bombard Cannon, Heavy Scorpion, Siege Tower, the works. And given that they get Torsion as well, which is their unique technology, giving increased blast radius, yes, that affects Siege Rams, Heavy Scorpions, and Bombard Cannons as much as it affects Siege Onagers. Um, that's going to be insane. The Siege is going to be awesome. It's going to be so good. Um, you know, those Siege Rams can do so much damage with increased blast radius. Um, yeah, watch out. Just watch out for the Ethiopian Siege. That's scary stuff right there. And their economy is, uh, again, pretty fleshed out. They don't get crop rotation, but... All of, that, uh, all of that mining is there, all of the, the wood cutting is there, and let's be honest here, are they going to need all that surplus food? Probably not, they're not going to be making that much cavalry, they probably won't be making that much infantry, um, so the lack of crop rotation is not the end of the world. Really, they are going to be focusing on siege if it's a land battle, and probably uh, shotals and archers. So, I think the Ethiopians are a pretty cracking civilization, and uh, like I say, I'll be doing that uh, civ guide in depth a little bit later on once the game is out. Next up, our third African civilization, and we're looking at the Malians. They are an infantry civilization, so something a little different once again. Their buildings cost 15% less wood. Their infantry get plus one pierce armor per age, starting in the feudal age. Their gold mining upgrades are free. The unique unit is the Gabeto, or the Ghetto Warrior, as I'll end up calling it. The unique technologies is, uh, are Tigui, which means that town centers fire arrows. And uh, basically, the, t the town center of the Malians with that technology will fire five arrows without anything garrisoned inside of it. So that's kind of cool for helping with raiding. They get Farimba, which gives their stable units plus three attack. And their team bonus is that university researches are 80% faster. So, having a quick look then at the Gabeto, or the Ghetto Warrior, as I like to call them, from the castle. Uh, the Gabeto is interesting. It's a female unit, one of the only female military units that are available in the game that isn't hero, I guess. And uh, if we have a look at the statistics real quick, costing 50 food and 40 gold, they're quite cheap. And uh, they are, again, similar, I guess, to the Shotel in the fact that they have very low HP and no armor whatsoever. 
their bonus is that they are again pretty quick and they also have a very very high attack and also six range so they're pretty well equipped to hit and run and basically just try and nuke the enemy i think it's you know appropriate to say the gabato is a nuking unit it runs in there it does a ton of dps and then it runs away again and uh, it's, you better run them away, because with 45 HP, they're going to die incredibly quickly if you don't watch out. So that's the Gabato right there, and we'll see them act in action in the scenario editor. So here we are once again, and this time we have a Gabato and an Elite Gabato in the scenario editor to look at. So the Gabato Warrior is similar to a Throwing Axeman, and the standard Gabato, non-elite, only has 30 HP. They're really, really weak on the HP. But they have a really high base attack of 10, and they have no pierce or melee armor at all on base. These guys have got a few upgrades here. They also have 5 range, which is actually fairly decent. I imagine these guys are going to be really cool at taking down skirms, for instance. The Elite Gabato has 45 HP, so it's an improvement of 15 health, which is not a huge amount, but uh, it's something, I guess. And a base 14 attack, so a really, really high attack at 6 range as well. So if they're like a medium range, very high attack unit, but even the Elite Gabato has no armor whatsoever, so they're incredibly, incredibly light armored. Let's attack this wall piece, though, to see that throwing animation, and you'll see that they do throw, like, axe type things right here. They're African throwing axes, I believe. That's a really nice animation right there. So these guys are going to be very interesting to see in use. Um, I, I can't wait to, to actually play some games with these because I'm going to be really curious to see just how effective they can be on mass. I wonder if they'd be great at taking down heavy cavalry, for instance. I mean, it, only time will tell, but this is a really exciting unit. Considering the Marlians are an infantry civilization, their archery range isn't actually that bad. They get a little bit of everything there. They do, however, miss Parthian tactics, which makes their heavy cavalry archers on the weak side. And uh, the thing that you're not seeing right here is that they don't get Bracer, which means that everything here, apart from the hand cannon, is going to be just knocked down a little bit. That extra range in attack is really significant, and that's going to weaken their archery range quite a lot, and offset the fact that they're supposed to be an infantry sib, I guess. At the barracks, it makes sense, of course, champion and halberdier right there, with full upgrades available. And of course, with that infantry plus one pierce armor, those guys are going to be tanky. So if you're playing against the Marlians, watch out for the Halbs and Champs, because the Halberdier alone are going to have seven pierce armor, which is huge. The stable is interesting because they don't get Hussar or Paladin, but they do get an additional uh, three attack from their Farimba research. So although they don't get those final upgrades on the Cavalier and the Light Cavalry, the plus three attack is going to make them very strong. It's also going to mean that their Camels are pretty formidable as well. Now from the... Uh, dock, here they are looking pretty strong as well. Once again, we've got to remember they don't get Bracer, which means their Galleons are not going to be quite as strong as the other Galleons out there, but I think their early game is going to be very good since, that their, since their buildings cost 15% less wood. It's going to give them some big savings on wood, and it's going to allow them to uh, have a very strong feudal and castle age when it comes to fighting on the water there. Over at the Siege Workshop, they do miss a couple of bits. They don't get Heavy Scorpion, which is not the end of the world, and they don't get Siege Ram, which is a little bit more disappointing. With Siege Onager still available, I think that's going to be very formidable for them, as well as Bombard Cannon, which is always a great fallback if you don't get some of the bigger Siege units, because it's great for countering those enemy Siege units out there. So taking a very quick look at their economy, and you'll see, once again, their farms are looking very good. Crop rotation there, all the way uh, all the way upgradable the mining camp they get a little bit of everything the lumber camp however they do miss two man saw and uh that's kind of going to weaken their navy in the Imperial Age. Um, since they don't get Bracer, their navy is going to be weakened in the Imperial Age. But like I said, I think they're really going to be very strong in the early stages of the game um, with that Feudal Age and Castle Age water aggression. With that cheaper wood cost, they will have some surplus available. 
So there we go, a quick overview of the Malians, and we will move on to the fourth and final civilization in the African kingdoms, who are the Portuguese. Oh yes, a lot of people have been, you know, have been begging for a Portuguese civilization to be added to the game, and now it is here, and it is official. The Portuguese are a naval and gunpowder civilization, and they have some pretty cool stuff to boot. So they get a few bonuses here. All of their units cost 15% less gold, and that's quite good, really. That's very good. Ships, plus 10% HP. They can build a Fatoria in the Imperial Age, and we'll see that in action very shortly, so bear with me on that. Unique units, they get the Organ Gun, which is a siege unit, and they get the Caravel, which is a warship. Their unique technologies, Karak, which gives their ships plus one armor um, on Pierce and Melee. And Arquebus, which means that their gunpowder units are affected by ballistics, which is awesome. Their team bonus is fantastic as well, and you guys who watch my stream and constantly yell at me to get cartography are going to be hoping that I play Portuguese all the time, because they get free cartography from the Dark Age, so no forgetting to click that pesky cartography button in the market. It's already done for you, and I think that's a really cool, unique bonus, um, and... Uh, I think as well that that's really going to help out newer players to the game. Having vision, having knowledge, that is power right there. So, unique units then, and looking at the first one, the castle unique unit, we get the organ gun. This is damn cool. It's a siege unit as a unique unit. I think that's a first, if you ask me. And um, an organ gun is essentially a buffed up, beefed up, better, bigger, badder hand cannon. And we'll see that in action in the scenario editor now. So here in the scenario editor, once again, we can see what the organ gun looks like. Isn't he a badass? And we can see that we have the elite organ guns here with 70 HP, 20 attack damage, 2 melee armor, 6 pierce armor, 8 range. Oh, and here's a horde of halberdier coming in. Let's see how these guys get shredded up. These guys are great against massed units, and you can see the organ guns here absolutely laying into these guys, but also being able to tank a reasonable amount of damage as well. It appears they have no minimum range, so these guys could last, and last, and go on, and go on, and these poor halberdier, they have got nothing on these organ guns right here. These organ guns are blasting them to pieces right now. Like I said, a very, very beefy version of a hand cannon. Just enjoy the carnage for a moment, I think. <laughs> Lovely stuff. I have no idea how many they just killed. Probably about 50. Something ridiculous like that. And we didn't lose too many either. Nicely done, guys. Nicely done. They also get their Caravel, which is a, uh, a new ship, actually. A very cool new ship. It's very similar to a scorpion on the water. Think of it like that. The Caravel's projectile, its missile, does damage to multiple targets. So it's not so good if all of your enemies are in a line in front of you, but it's great if they're all bunched up. It also has an attack bonus versus galleys. Uh, it also has an attack bonus versus the galley line, which makes it actually a pretty good counter to galleons in the Imperial Age. And since they get plus 10% HP and they get their Karak unique technology, it means that the um, the Caravel here is going to be a really formidable warship. In fact, the navy of the Portuguese is going to be formidable in general. We'll see that in action now. So here on the water, we have the Portuguese Caravel. Now, the standard Caravel has 143 HP, 6 attack, 8 pierce armor, and 6 range. The Elite Caravel has 165 HP, 7 attack, 8 pierce armor, and 7 range. So it's quite comparable to a Galleon with having the same amount of range and the same amount of HP and pierce armor. So let's patrol up here because, or attack move up here, sorry, because there is an enemy fleet. So you can see these guys in action a little bit. And you'll see a big difference between the projectiles here. You see the projectiles of the Caravel going through the enemy, whilst the projectiles of the galleons stop when they hit their target. Well, this means that the caravel is doing damage to units behind as well. And if the enemy was to be bunched up in a line facing you, then all of your projectiles would do damage to every... Well, each of your projectiles would do damage to all of the boats behind it. And that kind of makes these guys very strong in certain situations. 
And finally here for the uh, the Portuguese, the Feitoria, which is a unique building, one of a kind in Age of Empires. It generates resources over time, although it does take 20 population space. The Feitoria is fantastic. It's a really cool idea. It doesn't generate resources as fast as 20 villagers would, considering it takes 20 population, but it's really going to be great for the late game when gold and stone is really low and your Feitoria can just keep ticking over in the background. It only costs 250 wood and 250 gold as well, so it is cheaper than producing 20 villagers, and I think it could be a really interesting facet to a multiplayer game. Alright, so we have a Feitoria down in the scenario editor now. As you can see, it takes up 20 population and it's generating resources for us at one of each resource every couple of seconds. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is going to be tweaked a little bit between now and the release of the game. So expect these values to be slightly different. But the general principle is the same. It will generate resources over time, slowly but surely, similar to a relic in a monastery, only it will generate generate every single resource and it does take up population room. There's many benefits to having this amazing, beautiful building. I mean, look at it. Isn't that just gorgeous? There's so many benefits to this over having villagers. Not only is it cheaper to build it, but it's easier to defend it as well. Villagers are pesky. They block each other. They get raided. Whereas this, you have to defend with maybe a wall and maybe some towers and some military units, but you'd have to worry about running around and bumping into everything. Uh, this thing is going to be stationary and it's not going to be going anywhere. So that's the Fatoria for you, and it is absolutely awesome. Taking a quick look then at the Portuguese archery range, and they actually look pretty strong over here. They get Arbalest and uh, Hand Cannon, as well as the Elite Skirmisher, and that makes their crossbow Arbalest line actually fairly formidable, since they do get all of the blacksmith technologies available. They've also got Thumb Ring, so I think their archers are going to be pretty strong, actually. Of course, the, the thing that steals the show here is the hand cannon and the organ gun and the bombard cannon, since they get the ballistics uh, upgrade applied to them with the arquebus technology. And since their gold units cost 15% less, that's going to make those very expensive gunpowder units a little bit more obtainable. From the barracks, they get halberdier and champion, and once again, like I say, they do get all of those blacksmith upgrades available. They do, however, lack squires here, which is a bit of a weird one, so it's going to make these guys feel perhaps a little more sluggish in the Imperial Age, and give them, just, you know, knock them down a peg versus other civs that get all of those techs available. From the stable, things are looking pretty damn bad over here. The Portuguese do get bloodlines, which means that, you know, their, their night rush is going to be okay. But much further than that, and they're not going to have a great time, they don't get Hussar, so that late game raiding potential could be missing a little bit. No paladin and no camels, so to speak, of at all. Moving along to the Siege Workshop, and you'll see that they do lack a lot of Heavy Siege as well here. No Heavy Scorpion, no Siege Onager, no Siege Ram, but that Bombard Cannon is going to be the thing that they really fall back on. Since it's affected by gun... Uh, since it's afflicted by ballistics, it will be able to take down that enemy siege a lot better, and it's going to be a lot more versatile as well. So I think the Portuguese, although they lack that Heavy Siege, that Bombard Cannon is going to be fantastic for them. It's worth pointing out as well that they have a complete university, which is really awesome and not many, not something that many civs can really boast about. They get that Bombard Tower upgrade and all of the upgrades available here as well. Now it's worth noting that since they get masonry and architecture, they don't actually get hoardings from the castle. So they can increase the defense of their buildings, but that hoardings is going to let them down a little bit. And I guess that counters the fact that pretty much everything here is available. Finally, looking at the Portuguese economy, and you'll see that once again, they have a pretty good eco here. Obviously, no gold shaft mining here, and that's due to the fact that their units cost 15% less gold. Everything else, though, is available. That two-man saw upgrade, that stone shaft mining, and that crop rotation is there for the Portuguese late game, which is where the Portuguese, I think, are really going to thrive. Okay, so we've taken a look at the new civilizations and their tech trees, but what about new settings in the lobby? And there are quite a few new things here. First of all, we have a new game mode, and it's called Sudden Death. Now, in Sudden Death, you're only allowed one town center, and the way to win is to kill your opponent's TC. 
Now, as you can imagine, this makes things pretty interesting because it means that players have to send their you know villages further and further away from safety. It gets harder and harder to defend your economy as the game goes on, since you can't build new TCs. It also means that there's a great potential for like a, a you know a similar king snipe in regicide to a TC snipe in sudden death, with siege coming in busting down your walls and going straight for that TC. As soon as the TC is down, you're out of the game. There's also a bunch of new maps added in the, the expansion as well. We've got standard maps which have been added, and these are Kilimanjaro, Mountain Pass, Nile Delta, Serengeti, and Socotra. We'll take a look at these in turn now. So this is Kilimanjaro, and all of these new maps try and utilize the new terrains, animals, and trees, and such like that, that have been added into the game. As you can see, we've got the ostriches here, which are similar to deer. We have the fruit bush, which is like a, a berry bush, essentially. And we've got the, the elephant, which is huntable for food, similar to a boar. Though, of course, it has a little more food on it. Kilimanjaro then is quite an open map. It does have, you know, small tree lines around the TC and it opens up into, obviously, a big hill in the middle. It's all very, very high and steep up here with a little peak at the top where there is some snow going down but over to the other side where your enemy's base will lie. So fighting for the middle may be worthwhile, but there isn't a huge amount of resources out here other than trees. But holding the high ground can always be valuable and you'll probably see a lot of fights on hills on this map. So this is Mountain Pass and this map is a nomad start so it means you have to build your TC at the start of the game. It's a very messy map, there's a lot going on, very rugged terrain, lots of hills and of course since it's Mountain Pass you'll see some mountains as well, these brand new mountains which have been added into the game. They look fantastic, there's some here as well. Snow capped little peaks. Very snowy, very rugged, very hard to build um, on this map because there's so many hills and all of that. Now, in terms of resources, you've got sheep and deer, but there's no boar. So getting that initial food could be a little problem. And I expect, you know, it's going to be quite a slow build-up on this map. Welcome to the Nile Delta, the third map on our list, and uh, this map is very interesting. Now, you may notice this terrain right here is certainly new. This is cracked sand, and one thing about this terrain is that if you build on cracked sand, your buildings will be destroyed faster, they will be weaker, and I'll demonstrate that in the scenario editor after I've shown you uh, the maps. So similar to migration, there's not a lot here, a small number of resources and trees, and you'll have to get yourselves onto the mainland as fast as you can. Of course, in this game, uh, transport ships are available in the Dark Age, so you don't have to worry about booming up to the Feudal Age here and building everything on this weak, cracked sand. Control for the water, probably going to be important since there's a lot of fish out here and taking those fish can be a huge boost to your economy. Out on the edge, there's loads of trees, there's loads of uh, gold and resources to grab, so uh, getting out there as fast as you can and maybe fighting over the water. What could be interesting as well is if you migrated to your opponent's side of the map and that would force a conflict a lot earlier on. So this is Serengeti and this is essentially the African Arabia. This is very similar to Arabia. There's small clumps of trees. We've got the baobab trees, baobab trees over here, as well as the acacia trees. Uh, these guys are really cool because they have more wood on them. 200 wood versus 100 wood. And uh, the map is very, very sparse. It's very spread out. And um, I imagine, you know, very similar to Arabia. A lot of high aggression and things like that. You see the zebra back here as well, which are really awesome. Huntable, just like deer. That's Serengeti. There's not a huge amount to say about this one, but I think it'll be a very enjoyable map to play. And finally, on the new standard maps, we have Socotra. This one is awesome. As you can see, you start with a ton of villages, you start with a ton of resources, but there is, of course, a catch. You are on a very, very small island with your enemy, and there's nowhere to really run to. You might notice that there's water on this map, but it's not accessible. These stones around the edge are going to block any docks. There's no fish out here to be had. It's an empty void. The only thing you've got between your enemy and yourself are very, 
very small number of trees and a very small patch of land. So expect a lot of early aggression on this map and expect a lot of uh, interesting and intense fights for the gold and stone piles which are kind of, you know, pushed out towards the edge here. But a very close map, a very different map as well. And I love the approach with this one because it's so unusual to anything we've seen in any of the standard maps before. As well as the new standard maps, the expansion also adds some special maps. And these ones are absolutely insane. They are crazy. You've got a bunch of maps right here, and I'm not going to show you each individual one, but I will show you one as an example. What I'm going to do real quick is just set this up so that I have uh, three allies and four enemies. And I'll show you, uh, let's see, Snake Pit right here. Now this sets things up completely differently to how a standard game is set up. And you'll see in just a sec if we do Marco and Polo and we put the team colors on. Now if you have a look at the mini map, you'll see I'm at the center of the map and my three allies are behind me in yellow here. The enemy, they're all against us on the other side of the map in a line. So it changes the whole format. It changes from having two flanks and two pockets to having one flank, one pocket, one super pocket, and one super, super, super duper pocket way in the back of the map. All of the special maps have something like this in common. They're really changing the way that the game is played and that it changes the whole format of the maps as we know them. Now this map in particular, Snake Pit, is pretty interesting because there is an area where it opens at the north to fight for the water, maybe even offer some landing opportunities as well. While in the middle of the map it's covered in shallows, so it's making it practically impossible to wall this up since the shallows come directly to your TC. So as you can imagine, this really makes you think about different strategies and that's something that all of these special maps will do. And I know for a fact we're going to be playing a lot of special maps on the stream because they're going to be a hell of a lot of fun um, with loads of different strategies coming into play so keep an eye out for that so guys one last thing before we close this video out here we have a demonstration of how cracked sand makes your buildings weaker right here we have two wonders of the world two portuguese wonders and they are looking fantastic but Something is concerning me. I mean, look at this. The structural integrity of this building is at risk. It has been built in the most ridiculous place, on cracked ground. Who thought that was a good idea? And as a result, you'll see these Shotel warriors here attacking the buildings will have done different damage. So the... the Wonder that's been built on standard ground, currently at 5,418 health. This one over here, 5,000, well, 4,900 now. You can see it's clearly going down much faster when the unit attacking it is identical. And that is the cracked ground coming into play. Anything built on cracked ground is going to be weaker. And I believe that is a brand new feature to the African kingdoms. And it's something that is I think really cool. It's something that you can add to maps, add to scenarios, and maybe add another element of strategy into the game. It might even be that, you know, you have to build your wall over that. It could be some cracked ground that is, you know, preventing you from creating your wall off completely. And as a result, you have to wall over it, and that is where your opponent wants to target, because they can get through a little bit faster. So I'm going to end the video right here here before this wonder goes down and gets burnt to the ground that would be incredibly sad to see we don't want to see that but i want to thank you guys so so much for watching it is really appreciated and i hope you enjoyed the video and uh, you, you're really really hyped for the expansion because i certainly am now i'm going to be doing a lot of coverage of the expansion um, like i said earlier on i'll be doing those civ guides i'll be doing loads and loads of streams so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already Make sure you check out the live stream twitch.tv forward slash zero empires where I will be um, streaming nearly every day after the release of the expansion, doing the campaigns, playing community games with you guys and doing all that good fun stuff. So thank you guys for watching as always. I've been Zach and I'll see you next time.